This episode is brought to you in part by our sponsor, Tidal Influence, a Californian ecological consulting firm who proudly supports environmental education and all of the diverse conservation efforts that Pelicanus works to highlight. Visit their website at tidalinfluence.com to learn more about what they do to conserve our coastal resources and how you can get involved. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Pelicanus. Pelicanus is a nonprofit organization focused on sharing the movement that is and has been happening in the conservation field. Now, this is Conservation Conversations, our long form documentary style show that highlights the people and organizations that are making it their purpose to grow the conservation field and to show that people have and still are making monumental differences in our world with intentional change. Head over to pelicanus.org to find all of our episodes and more. On today's episode of Conservation Conversations, we talk with Nikki Buxton of Belize Bird Rescue. Founded in 2004, Belize Bird Rescue is Belize's only multi-species avian rescue and rehabilitation center. Belize Bird Rescue has the ability to rehab and release all species of birds, but specializes in saving parrots, including the endangered yellow-headed Amazon. Now, if you're just listening to this episode, please consider finding the video version on our YouTube page, as we were able to do this interview in person and we were given a tour of their facilities. These birds are amazing and beautiful to watch, so it won't disappoint. Thank you to Nikki and your team for showing us a great time. Enjoy our conversation with her. Can you just tell us where we are, uh, what this place is, and uh, we'll get our way into how you guys started? Yeah, I mean, this is actually, this is Belize Bird Rescue now. Um, it's actually on Rock Farm. That was a property that we bought and named, trying to build a home for ourselves to a base for ourselves, somewhere nice and warm. We lived in the UK, my husband's work took him all over the world, so it didn't matter where we lived as long as, you know, it was somewhere secure and safe. And we chose Belize because it's English speaking, because it's reasonably accessible, it had a a nice government and nice people and nice weather. (laughs) And we found this property and fell in love with it, so. And then probably, Two months after being here, just playing in the garden and trying to build a little wall around the house we hadn't even built yet, we ended up buying two baby parrots, which we knew was a mistake because we didn't need any pets at that point. We wanted to travel, but we couldn't bear to see this kid walk along the road trying to sell these birds. It broke my heart, absolutely broke my heart. So we bought the parrots, we hand raised them, knowing absolutely nothing about it, being able to find absolutely nothing about it. This is 2003 when the internet was around but there wasn't that much on it you know there certainly wasn't the content that there is now and uh, we managed to hand raise them healthily release them and they joined a wild flock and after that people just started bringing us more birds and <laughs> here we are <laughs> yeah uh, what kind of parents were those <clears throat> they were red lords okay. two red lords from the same nest we actually, uh, we went to the forest department after a little while, after a year or two of people bringing us birds, we went to the forest department and said, this is insane, you know, everybody has parrots. People are constantly bringing us parrots to release, and yet your law says it's illegal to have them, so how come this situation exists? And they said, we simply can't enforce the law because there's nowhere to put them. So that's how we ended up signing a piece of paper with the forest department to say we would be that place for them to put them, to enable them to enforce their, their wildlife act. So from buying two baby parrots, Mm -hmm. how long did it take to then year the place where everyone brings parrots? Um, Realistically, I would say 2006, so three years. Three years. Three years. But um, it was a steep learning curve, so I'm actually quite glad that we didn't jump out there and say, we're the experts, we know what we're doing, because we didn't. I mean, (laughs) we absolutely didn't. That's when we got in touch with the World Parrot Trust initially and said, how do we do this? We don't want to reinvent the wheel. And they said, we don't know. If you find out, let us know. So we've had a good relationship with them ever since, and now there are other centres springing up doing a similar kind of thing, rehabbing ex-captive parrots. So do you do you limit what you're able to take in, or is it any? We've never said no, never, and that's I think that's how the place has expanded naturally. That we built to accommodate whatever it is that comes along. Because although we're focusing on the parrots, and that's always been our true love, we take in every single species. We've never said no to anything. Um, so we have a waterbird enclosure, we have a raptor barn, we have songbird facilities, and um, everything 
has been accommodated, <laughs> which is how the facility has grown to where it is now. And are you supported by the Belizean, Belizean government? Uh, morally, Mor from the wings, <laughs> a little applause now and then. <laughs> no, they've got no money for anything but humanitarian products. So. We, a lot of our funding comes from the U.S. through private donors. Mm. We do a lot of online fundraising with Facebook, and, you know, the usual. And you're saying hopefully soon you'll have the 501c3 yes, status. Yes, which is we'll exciting. Yeah. So some donations, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Can you yeah. just talk about a, a, the day-to-day? -day? Like, what is it, how much, what does it take to take birds in and, and turn them around and release them back to the wild where they can go back into, uh, you know, serving a, the native population? That is a, a big question. Yeah. And if we just focus mostly on parrots, which I think it, everybody seems to be interested in what we're doing with the parrots, because the other species, I think uh, there's a lot of rescue centers in the North, North America and Canada that work with those other species, but these um, neotropicals are a little bit of a mystery to a lot of people. And parrot rehab particularly has, for the longest time, the experts were saying it can't be done. You can't take a parrot that has been in captivity and rehabilitate it. And... Uh, We've proven them wrong, there's not a question, and uh, it's been a long road and a big learning curve. But we realized that the, the biggest problems, well, the, there's several problems, but the biggest problems are the physical disabilities that they acquire while they're in captivity through bad diet and bad husbandry, and the mental imprinting on humans. So they're the two things that we really have to address. And obviously there's some physical things we can't change. If they can't see or they can't fly because their wings are missing or broken or something, then there's not much we can do. But everything else we can, with time, with the right conditions, we can turn that around. So that's where we start. We'll take a, a parrot that has been in captivity, that's talking, that has had clipped wings, and put them into a flock of similar kinds of birds, the exact same species but similar conditions, and um, just give them time. That's all it is. We give them good food and vitamin supplements and enrichment and encouragement and time and just leave them alone. And that's it. Yeah. Just, <laughs> They'll figure it out. They're wild animals. You know? And you, you ask any parrot owner in the States that, that their bird is so close to wild. It's not domesticated. It hasn't been selectively bred over decades and generations, the same as some of our domestic species. It's just a wild animal in a cage. We take the yellowhead babies that are not going to survive, the ones that might get poached or predated or the nest might fail or the siblings have squashed the tiny ones. So we take the, the smaller of the two or the entire nest, depending on the circumstances, hand raise them and then return them at the end of the year uh, to pollen breeding season. So that's what these are. These are the yellowheads that have already fledged, so obviously much more advanced than the ones you saw as hand raising. Um, they're still using the tube and the soft food, but not, not down the throat like that, just straight into the mouth, yeah. and they're picking from plates. So once they've got the skill of feeding themselves completely, we move them to an aviary way in the forest over there, away from people, and keep them uh, pristine. And the last thing you want is to go out talking. It makes us look bad, it makes them sound bad, and the neighbors will not like it out there. <laughs> and these are returned to Payne Street National Park in the south of the country, which mm -hmm. is where they came from. But if you wanted to go in, you can get the. You said these are the yellowhead Amazons? Yes, they are? yeah, Amazon or Auratrix. It's um, locally critically endangered, and according to the red list, it's just, uh, just endangered. Mm -hmm. There used to be, uh, I think in the 1990s, there were 70,000 of them. Nowadays, there's about 1,200. So the poaching level on that has been very severe because they're so fought, sought after for the pet trade, and also they nest in the pine savannah. So you see this flat, flat savanna, and then this tall pine tree with a little yellow head sticking out of it. They're very obvious. Um, and they're loyal to their nest sites, so the poachers can go back year after year and harvest every single year. So. There's a few sticks to negotiate, I'm afraid. It's not built for humans in there. <laughs> that head bobbing is typical begging. You can't tell the sex of these, they all look the same, even in adulthood. We've got 19 that will go back this year. We've just released the 16 from last year, and they've already integrated with the wild flocks, and they're doing really well. I think that brings it to about 158 that we've put back, which in a population of 1,200 is pretty good, considering these would have died or entered the pet trade. Yeah. 
Do you know how many? Um, do you know how many birds you've brought through and released? It's several thousand parrots. Definitely. Several um, thousand? Uh, over a thousand. Oh, oh no, there's several thousand. My gosh, that would be a lot. <laughs> <laughs> the, the thing is, though, with our rehab program, it's, uh, we only get what, what is brought to us or what the Forest Department confiscates. So we're limited by the number of birds that come in in that regard. Then um, we make sure that every bird is absolutely capable of being released. There's no guesswork there. For the most part, they're released around the center. We can observe what they're doing. And if there's any issues, we can pull them back and give them more time. Um, there are some the um, protocols in a couple of rehab centers are that they will take them out into the forest, just release them and turn their back on them. I can't believe that works. Seeing the birds that we have come through here, I, I just I think that's a pretty stressful situation for any bird, let alone one that was in captivity. So we don't do that. And that's why it takes us so long. Um, the, the limits we had from the forest department were based on the kind of selective confiscation, which is why we started the license program that we have. We were, um, they, would, they would take a bird from one house, but not from another. And it was because they had contacts or you know, a little bit influence politically. Um, and we said, we're not doing that anymore. You, you've got to do it right across the border or we're not helping you. Um, and so that's where the license program came in, where we have minimum standards for a bird that's already in captivity. They have to be in a certain size cage with certain um, different kinds of perching, different foods, uh, shade, shelter, shade. Um, and they have to be hand tamed. Otherwise, it's a wild bird in a cage and it should come for rehab. And that would be the best solution. And the idea was to draw a line on any bird that was already in captivity and anything beyond that should be confiscated. Any new birds entering the trade. That was the plan behind the license program. What I'm, I'm really interested in is the, the yellow headed parrot conservation. Can you kind of give a, a background of the, the issues behind the yellow-headed, well, how their their population, you gave a number earlier, the 12,000 down to or whatever it was. <laughs> um, yeah, 70,000 down to 12. 70,000 down to 1,200. Uh-huh. Yeah. Can, can you talk about all the reasons why that happened and, and, you know, just more about their conservation and what you guys are doing to help them recover? Sure. Um, the yellowhead parrot is highly sought after by Belizeans and Mexicans and Guatemalans for their ability to talk. So they want to be put in cages so they can talk. It's also a, it's a pine savanna nester, so its nests are very obvious and very easily accessible to poachers, and they're loyal to their nest sites, so the poachers can go over and over to the same nest year after year and retrieve the birds. And it's lucrative. Um, it's a tough argument to make when you've got a, a small, like, small family from a, a village, a remote village in the south of the country, which is always... Um, a little poorer than the rest of the country and then try and tell them they can't use their only source of income to put their kids through school. It's, it's a tough one. Right. But uh, so what we decided to do, we were working with um, Tide who are monitoring the, the yellowheads and protecting the habitat in Paynes Creek, Swayze, Bladen, down in South. And uh, the rangers there, particularly one ranger Mario was observing that the, a lot of the, the chicks that are the second, sorry, the third or the fourth egg will not survive. So we, we figured let's, let's try and bring those birds out and keep them safe and raise them and then take them back and see if we can bring up the populations naturally fledging that way. And I, it, it was a, a bit of a learning curve. It took a two or three years of, we made a few mistakes. We took them back at the wrong time. We took them back too early and there were no adults in the area. So although they were being protected by the rangers once they were released, they weren't finding adult populations to 
to gravitate towards. So they ended up going to the Rangers because that was the next best thing. So we realized that was a mistake. And then the year after that, we released during the height of the breeding season again. And it was just, it's been all downhill since then. You know? yeah. And in that period of time, Blockwood. our biggest block was 28 one year that we released. And um, it's normally around 16 to 22. And you release like once a year usually at yeah. all the same time? Yeah, they, the hand raised ones go out usually around April, April or May. And then we start, we start getting the babies in around April or May too. So it's kind of a rolling program. And you kind of mentioned it when we were walking around, but um, you said that the pine savanna forest and the yellow headed parrot just kind of go together. Can you talk about how, like, what it is about the yellow headed parrots, why they're, they're so necessary to that? Habitat. Sure. The uh, I wish I knew as much as the rangers down there. They do tell me all these things, and it kind of it goes. Some of it stays in my head. Yeah. But <laughs> um, there's certain seeds and fruits out there that I must be dispersed by these birds. They're one of the few. Well, they're the only parrot really that is consistently out there. And then certain fruits have those hard seeds that only a parrot beak can crack open. Yeah, their their nests because they're in these pine trees are, are very visible. And um, unfortunately, what the poachers do is if, because the nest is pretty deep and they can't get a hand in there, they take a machete and they make a new hole at the base of where they think the cavity finishes, and then they reach in that way to get the chicks. So the following year, the parents will come along and excavate from that chop mark down. So you end up with hole chop mark hole, chop mark hole, then the tree dies. Yeah. So the nests are effectively destroyed within a few years by poaching. Um, so the rangers down there have been putting up artificial nest boxes, which has really boosted the number of breeding population as well, which is great. Um, and plus they know where they are, they can monitor them better, and they can go in and pull the, the little chicks and bring them here much more easily. So it's working out quite well. It's it's been since 2014 we started this, and we're really kind of getting into a, a stride now. It's nice. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, just out of curiosity, what, uh, how high are their, are their nests usually? Some of them are like 20, 30 feet. Some of them are, are waist height. Wow. Yeah, if it's just a stump left and the parrots are still using it, they're right there. Wow. Yeah. What we do is kind of highlight the people that are doing this work just for the sake of doing it. Mm -hmm. No one's asking you to, to do this. No one asks you to start this. And there's, you know, there's thousands, you know, maybe hundreds of thousands of, of people and organizations like yourself. Yeah. And we're we're trying to figure out why <laughs> why people do this. And, Join the club. <laughs> and highlight it. And so, you know, we kind of ask some kind of a, you know, bigger, bigger questions, you know, what is it that keeps you going? How did you, know, how did you, I mean, obviously you told us how you got started, mm -hmm. but how does it that yeah. you made that switch? You're like, oh, this is what I'm going to do. I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. We've had a couple of, you know, crossroads where we've thought, should we carry on? Should we? And, you know, I, it, it sounds pathetic. It sounds really girly, but you just want to look at their little faces, honestly. How can you not? They're just adorable, yeah. and and they're not getting any help. The the people say, you know, oh, how are the red laws doing? So well, nothing's doing well. Nothing. We're doing so much damage with um, the way we treat the environment, with the way we abuse and use these animals. And somebody's got to do something. And nobody was doing anything. And you know, once you start, you can't stop. And I guess if somebody else came along and they could do what I did, and they wouldn't take it on, then and I could be sure that they would, then maybe I would think about having a day off. <laughs> but, yeah. And honestly, it's, it's, it's ego, too, you know, mm. to take those little guys and raise them and have them flying free and release them and see. They, it's such a joy. It's a joy for me. It's a joy for them. And that's cool, too. That's awesome. Yeah. And so is that what keeps you... Or is that what gives you 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 hope? Is that just to just keep doing it just, and seeing every year you release the bird? Is that what gives you hope? Hope for that bird. Yeah. I try not to think about the big picture. It's like uh, it's like people say, you know, you can't save everyone. You save the ones you love, and that's my thing, I guess, as parents. You don't have to do this. You're drawn. You're compelled for all the reasons that you shared. You also don't have to do the engagement and the mm -hmm. outreach. And so what motivated that? Where does that come from? What kind of message are you trying to get across? What kind of uh, relationships are you trying to build? 
that's an interesting question. I have to be honest, that's not my favorite part of the job. Um, but I know it comes hand in hand. Uh, much like you say, you have to work with people to be able to save the animals. Um, part of why I originally started going out there was I understood that people had birds in captivity. I understood that they wanted to keep them as pets. And I also understood that the forest department's uh, reach and um, drive was limited. So some of those birds were always going to stay in captivity. So what I was trying to do was stop the turnover of pets. So my initial education was on pet care. Look after the bird, feed it right, look after it right, and it will live longer than you. And then you won't be going out every single year and getting a new bird, which is basically what was happening. Um, so that's that was kind of the incentive behind that. And it snowballed from there. And once the license program kicked in, and I actually had a message to take to people to say, you have to look after this bird because you're not getting another one. When this bird dies... You're not going to be allowed another one. It's going to be confiscated. So that added a little more weight to my message, knowing that the forest department was going to finally enforce that law. And and then the last thing, I think, I feel like the younger generation are not as interested in keeping wild animals or eating wild animals or, you know, they become more environmentally conscious. Belize is getting more access to the internet. They're seeing TV, um, YouTube, TikTok, all that. And there's so much... Um, message, environmental messages out there that is now finally reaching this country. The, the, the youth are saying it's not acceptable. You're killing our planet. You're killing our future. You're killing our wildlife and we're not having it anymore. So I'm seeing that too, which is really gratifying. It's nice to watch. Yeah, I think that's how we kind of came out mm -hmm. too, is that we're kind of of that generation saying, hey, wait, what, why are we doing what we're doing? Yeah. And then, you know, we're also taking that, that, that uh, viewpoint of all right, what do we do now? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so I guess that's my next question: is what? Uh, what's next for you guys? Do you have big plans? Do you have just oh, yeah. much doing? Yeah. Huge plans, no money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I really want. Um, I need a full-time public awareness media person. I would love to employ that person that could just be the face of BBR that would be out there all the time, and. That way we would make sure that any bird that needed help, the person who saw that bird knew exactly who to call and where to come. Mm. Um, I would also like to put this organization in the hands of a Belizean organization rather than it being in a, I mean, this is on our private land. So the next obvious step is to locate it somewhere where maybe the government would gift a piece of land and we relocate to that piece of land. And then it would become something that would outlive me because I don't have a succession plan like that. I've only got so many more years in me <laughs> before I can't get out of bed anymore. <laughs> um, and that's, I guess, they're my two big things, is to, to get more public awareness out there and to show appreciation to the members of the public who do help us out and to have this go on beyond me. Thank you again to Nikki from Belize Bird Rescue. It's astounding what they've created and the amount of birds they've been able to save. Please visit their website at BelizeBirdRescue.com and consider donating to their cause. Any amount will go a long way to saving the biodiversity of Belize and they really deserve more help. Hosts and producers for this episode are Austin Parker and Taylor Parker. Music was provided by A Picture Book Studios. Please like, comment, and subscribe to our page if you haven't already. Thanks again, we'll talk to you next time.